Thank you to all the presenters, whether it was a Cracker Barrel, Chat and Chew, presenter at a concurrent session, whatever you did. Thank you to the presenters. Thank you to everyone that had the good sense to register. <laughs> we hope you register again next year. <laughs> and thank you to the committee. One more time, the 2010 committee. You're here. I hope I, oh. Thank you to the ISPI staff. Okay, with that, let's officially begin the closing session. This session focuses on two things. The university competition, uh, case study competition, and then your closing speech. And your closing speech is really great. The university competition started last year. It was the idea of Matt Donovan and his staff and his company, they have endless and boundless energy because the people who, who um, are involved, it's so realistic and they spend so much time. And I don't think we can possibly appreciate all the time they spend. So with that, please thank you, Matt and the committee. We're going to start with Matt explaining all the what's going into the competition. He'll tell you a little bit about it. If you're at one at a university as a faculty member or a student who will still be a student next year consider at requesting with Matt that your school will be considered to join the competition for next year. We're looking for some of the teams that were here this year and some new ones. With that, Matt. Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you uh, to everybody here for the opportunity for the uh, to come to the case study competition, this is our second annual case study competition. Last year was a roaring success, and this year as well. Uh, we had three repeating universities from last year, and we had the uh, blessing to have two new universities join us. Uh, and we were really 19 outstanding students who put together five outstanding deliverables, uh, bringing together probably one of the strongest set of deliverables that we've seen in our second annual. Uh, the student work continues to get better each year, and we hope to continue and expand uh, the uh, role that the case study competition takes into emerging talent, and really looking to bridge the gap between uh, the, the, the long-time professionals who bring a lot of expertise in that emerging talent. And the case study competition really is a key asset in that, you know, in, in taking that journey to becoming professionals. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the case, if you don't mind. So a little bit about the case is that Magic Sticks, which was the company we used last year, has a new performance problem this year. And basically, they're going to roll out gelato. So not only are they the world's best maker of breadsticks, fictitious breadsticks, but the world's best, uh, they are now going to add gelato. So the charge for the student teams was to actually put together a consulting group to help us identify the best way to roll out that gelato. So with that, I would like to take a look at the actual teams that helped uh, come together and present with this. So we had teams from five different universities. We had Boise State, San Diego State, Capella University, San Francisco State University, and the University of West Florida. Now the two new teams this year come from Capella University and San Francisco State University, and we were very glad to have them. I would also like to say that two of our schools, Boise State and the University of West Florida, uh, were not in the top three last year, but this year they did make it into the top three and were able to present at the concurrent session. And it really shows a lot of testament to take the energy to go back, take the feedback, come back with a stronger team than next year, and really deliver. 
So uh, I'd like to really quick just give all the teams a quick round of applause. So let's take a look at actually what the teams have put together. So with this, we have one fictitious company who is driven to now sell gelato. We had five detailed proposals, including unique creative solutions to help Magic Sticks achieve its goal. We had 11 live interviews with Magic Sticks fictitious employees, but very engaging. We had, we had the CEO, we had uh, store managers, we had an employee. Uh, we actually had Michael Hamm and Meg Shonen. They were all actual characters that played key roles, and the students got to interview them to learn more about the initiative, what the outcomes were, and so it was a really exciting, interactive component to the case. Uh, over 115 pages of feedback from the judges, which is, you know, if feedback is a gift, this year was a blessing. <laughs> so then looking at 200 pages of deliverables, interview notes, charts, and data generated. So if you simply go by volume, which is not always the best thing to get with volume, but in this case it is. It was very solid material put together. 300 hours of team development time and an immeasurable amount of learning and fun. And as myself, I, I think I can go back to being one human being. I played Michael Ham, and at one time one of the participants actually asked me, he said, are you mad or are you Michael at this moment? And uh, my response was, I really don't know. <laughs> Is there a third choice? So. Um, now let's take a look at our uh, judges. So after all these were submitted, our judging panel actually uh, reviewed this, put in a significant amount of time to review these, uh, each of these case submissions. So all those pages of documentation and data they went through with a lot of detail, uh, documenting their notes with that, and providing feedback on each, each aspect of both the document that was submitted as well as the presentations that occurred here on site. So. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the actual teams, and here's how we're going to try and do this. So, uh, we'll see how good I am at performance production, which will be a little suspect. So, what's going to happen is I'm going to introduce the teams. I'd like them to come up this direction. Uh, I would like the judges, if you wouldn't mind, come on up stage as well. And what we're going to do is students are going to come across. We'll give them the plaque. The judges will shake their hand. We'll put them in a seat. We'll take a photo. So, you'll watch. Hopefully, we'll get better by the fifth team. Okay, I will call the team. We have Team Dandelion Shop. And this is a fine photo of that group from San Francisco State. So if they would come on, if they would come on up, please. Here we go, up front. So on the team, we have Bob Friedman, Alicia Diego Clark, Grace Esteban, and Ken Pollock. And the faculty sponsor is Dr. Graham Davis. Marcy is the chair of the Emerging Talent Committee. So Marcy, the, the, the picture is Marcy, the judges, Matt, me, and the team and their faculty sponsor. Alicia Delone, Sue Sorotsky, 
Corey Welch and Joe Huber, uh, who is not able to join us today. The faculty sponsor is Dr. Jamie Barron.
work really, really hard. And to do Thank you again to the judges. We, yeah. All the other teams, all the other universities now consider throwing your hand in the ring. We'll eventually use criteria to pick the ones up from the packages that, that, that are interested. Again, thank you, Matt. You're phenomenal. <laughs> Next, we have our third keynote speaker, and Judy Hale, who I think everybody knows, um, and she'll come up and do the introduction for Deaf Page. Judy.
have a lot of fun. And she comes down and we lock ourselves in my basement. And uh, she brings her dog, uh, and then we have two dogs, and then my daughter brings over her dog. And so we're sitting in there just working blissfully, and they're just hounds swirling around everywhere around us. And we feel like it's perfectly normal, don't we, Judy? We get a lot of good work done. I'm so happy to be here. For the first time in eight years, I feel normal. I'm talking to people who use the same language. I don't have to translate it. I don't have to apologize for it. And it has been the most wonderful conference, being here among people who have a lot to share, who are willing to share their tools and their ideas. And every, I don't think I've ever, well, we put on a ton of conferences. I don't think I've ever been to one with this quality, consistent content. Would you agree? This is absolutely right. You are also the right people at the right time. It's really crazy out there. All these things that are going on around the world, our workforce has uh, 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 doubled new policies that could increase our risk and responsibility with our health care and other options, things going on in the climate. I mean, who would ever think that you couldn't go to get here from Paris because of a volcano? All of these crazy things that are going on. And I don't know about you, but we spend a lot of time thinking about this and their impact on public education and how we respond. But for today, this isn't about those things. And for right now, it isn't about all those people, your company, your sector, all those people you're trying to help. For this afternoon, for just a little while, it's not directly about, about them, it's just about you. Our goal here this afternoon is working on how do you increase your value, sell your value, and get people to want to work with you and even pay you for doing it. We also want to talk to you about how do you apply that unique value that you bring to the table to help solve some of the most critical problems of our time, such as those we saw in the first slide. Now, if you're like a lot of people I know, I'm so tired of hearing these excuses saying, well, you know, we just can't sell anything, we can't do anything right now because nobody's buying it, or I can't get to the uh, CEO or the economic buyer, or, you know, um, if I went and talked to them, they still wouldn't understand what I was trying to do. And it's just too chaotic out there. It's crazy in the, my company, it's crazy in my sector, it's crazy in the world right now. Who would possibly want to buy anything? What could I possibly do? Well, you can see the world through that viewpoint, or you can see it through a little known business pundit, Doug Page, who happens to be my husband and the leader of a very successful energy construction and service company. Now, he gets anxious if he's in the room and I introduce him, so I promised I wouldn't, but if you look around and see the most handsome man in the room, that's my husband. <laughs> but what Doug said is where there is chaos, there is profit. So we should be very, very profitable right now. There's lots of chaos out there. But wouldn't you agree that today, more than ever before, organizations need experts who can create solutions, innovations, breakthroughs, and who can take a systemic view of these very complex problems that are rooted out there in the, work, the workers' environment and the workplace. That's what I've heard all this week long. Every session I've gone into has been about solving complex problems, working with people, analyzing, looking at data, evaluating. And we need proactive problem solvers more than ever. I've heard that it was a really great session for those of you that are just forgetting in the profession or trying to figure out how do you get to the CEO, how do you get to play. Here's my advice from an old woman. If you're a young person out there, beg for forgiveness. Don't ask for permission. They'll never figure out what you're trying to tell them anyway. Just do it. And then fix it and then show them you fixed it. And then they'll want some more of it. Now, if you look at what the Skills Commission said, look at the skills that are most highly valued in the 21st century. Creativity and innovation coupled with sheer competence. If you're a CPT, you have documented sheer competence. You also have documented strong analytic skills, flexibility, adaptability, the ability to collaborate. Think about these college teams here. You guys have all demonstrated, all five of you are winners, that you have the skills that are needed to solve today's problems. 
Now, if you look at what Central Public Education said, they said there's two skills, you can break them down, but two skills that are the most needed in the 21st century. The first is complex communication. The ability to interact with people, to get information, to explain it, or to persuade people with it. The second is expert thinkers. This is what we in HPT land call solving ill-structured problems. Or problems we've not anticipated that can't be solved in predictable rule-based ways. This sounds like they're looking for us. We have 21st century skills. There's no lack of unexpected, complicated, and ill-structured problems and complexity. And if you look at any of these industries that are represented here or others, can you think of a single one that isn't dealing with complex problems that need to be solved? We are the right people at the right time. We have the right skills, but it means we're going to have to dig into our toolkit. How many of you got great tools while you were here? Something you can automatically go back and do something. You probably already used it before you left, before you left here, right? We've got the best toolkit in the world. If you look at the one that um, I just can't wait to download it, the one that ISBI has on the website, that toolkit, look at the new books that are coming out. They're loaded with practical tools, simple tools, and our standards of practice are simply the roadmap for mastering the challenges of the 21st century. But not everybody feels so warmly about people of our ilk. Look what the uh, Employers Federation of India, what their president said about HR professionals. That the, the, what we do is just such common sense and so practical, it really can't be of much value to the enterprise. But then he went on to say, unless we know how to manage and attract talent, help solve problems, and to have the multiple skills to help our companies grow and succeed in the 21st century. So getting to the table to make the deal means having our value clear for our clients, the senior decision makers, and really being seen as serious professionals with credibility based on evidence. Isn't that what we've been talking about all week? Isn't that what CPT is all about? Is having the proof. Now, how many of you have ever said you've gone home or you've been talking to a colleague at work, or maybe you've been working with a particularly prickly client, or Maybe I know there's at least one teacher in the audience who, think, who, who might say, gosh, I wish that parents could appreciate how, jar, how hard our job is, or clients could understand how hard we work. Anybody ever said that to somebody at home? I just wish they could get it. They just don't know how hard we work and how hard we do that. We want them to appreciate us, to see our value, to be fully aware with gratitude. And you want that person in the senior suite to open the door and let you come in and appreciate that you're there part of the organization to able to help. Well, to do that, what we have to do is focus on what I call our value gap. Our value gap is a definable, detectable difference between us and those we want to hire us, to pay us, give us authority, give us political cover, sponsor us, follow us. It's all about the difference in our value and what we bring to the table. Now, you might think about it like this. It can be like doctor-patient. If you can heal yourself in every regard, would you ever have to go to the doctor? Certainly not. But when you're sick, that's the first person you want to see, right? You realize they know something you don't know. They can do something you don't, can't do, and you're willing to pay for it. It's also like teacher-student, coach-player, preacher-sinner, if you want to go there. So our value has to be definable. When something is definable, what does that mean? We can, can't use the same word, can't define it, you have to be able to explain it, tell it, say it, okay? Detectable needs you to be able to what? See it, hear it, okay? And our value must be desirably different. It must be something that the audience wants from us. Now, when, when I was uh, 42, I found myself in a situation that I had never anticipated being in. After 20 years of marriage, I was single. And, and when you're 42, what the statistics tell you, if anybody's in this uh, demographic pool, I don't need to depress you. <laughs> but you have a better chance if you're a 42-year-old woman of being hit by lightning twice than finding the right man. <laughs> so I had some friends who took pity on me. They know I'm a gardener. They set me up with this 
very nice, handsome man who was also a gardener. His wife had died a few years before. We went out to dinner. Now, this is the first time I have dated in more than you know 25 years. I, I, I had no idea what the rules were anymore. So we went out to dinner. We sat there and talked. And I was extremely nervous. He was seen to be extremely nervous. We talked about gardening, all everything you could say about gardening. And when there was nothing else left to say, there wasn't much chemistry here. And so he said, well, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I tell you, I'm a consultant, and I work with people with value propositions. And so I started talking about the definable, detectable difference. The night was finally over, and I could go home. <laughs> then he calls me the next week, would I like to go on another day? And I thought, he's such a nice man. I don't want to be rude to him. And I said, and maybe I was just nervous. We'll just try it one more time. He shows up at my house to pick me up. He flips open his laptop in my driveway. He has a PowerPoint presentation on his value. <laughs> All right, now let's break it apart and evaluate. Which part did he miss? He could define it, but what was his problem? I could not detect it. He was out of there. That was it. <laughs> when I met the man, let's get some men in the room, that is my husband. I can tell you, the moment I saw him, there was a definable, detectable difference, and he's made that difference in my life. So you can use this as, as CPTs and doing HPT, but you can also use it at home. The stuff works. <laughs> but our difference, just like I started out talking about how I finally feel normal with all of you nice people, is that what makes us hard to value and hard for people to understand the craft that we do is also the same thing that makes us valuable. So it's all about how do we help people see the value. Here's my rule. If you can't tell it, you can't sell it any way you try. My experience is, is that most of us carry around a very vague understanding of what our strengths are and what we can bring to the table. You've all had your Myers Bridge. You know, if you're an INPJ or FTP, Elemental P, you've done your disc. You know your DISC, you know if you're yellow, green, orange, blue. You know all these things about yourself. But what is it that makes your, your definable, detectable difference that makes someone to hire you, follow you, involve you, be in a relationship with you? Well, it's built on three things. Six, six things, three sets of two. The first one is your knowledge and expertise. Now think about this, in most of the companies that I know, the organization I work in, we work in teams, sometimes self-organizing, self-managing teams. If you're going to work in a team, don't you need to know what the other people in the team know and are able to do so you can help each other out? And don't you think they need to know what you know and be able to do for you to be successful in working together? Well, the first thing is, what is your knowledge and expertise? Think deeply about this. What do you know that they don't know? This isn't setting yourself up to look better than them. This is just setting you up to have a conversation about what we can do together. What do you know that they don't know? What have you done that they've not done? How can you help them solve their problems? And going back to um, some of our earlier speakers, I added this one after hearing one of the speakers. What can we do to make them happy? Our skills and resources. This is where all of us in ISPI are so richly blessed. Just if you just walk through the bookstore over there. What can you do that they can't do, won't do, or don't do? Maybe they don't have time to do it. They don't have the expertise, but you have the skill to do it. What resources can you access on your behalf? Grants you can write. Um, the huge toolkit that we have. How can you help them solve their problems? How can you make them happy? How can you make them feel good? Customers only want two things. They want the problem solved and or feel good. Time and attention. How will you devote your time and attention when they can't, don't, or won't? What level of attention are you willing to give them on their behalf? How can you help them solve their problems make them happy? I have a wonderful CPA. When I first started my business, I'd never run a small business before. Uh, this was after I left Citibank, and he called me, and he said, he call me every now and then, he'd say, I know you're not thinking about this item that has to do with your taxes, because I know you're busy trying to build a business. But have you thought about so-and-so? It was such a relief to know that there was somebody out there thinking of me on my behalf, 
when I didn't have time to think about those things, I was trying to think about starting a business, being in business, and staying in business. So think about who is it that you're wanting to serve, that you want them to hire you, engage you in a project. One of the best lines is coming up and saying, you know that problem in customer service that we have? Well, I've been thinking about that. That's why I got to start a whole corporate university. We had a change in CEO. I had had some notions uh, working in training that we probably could use some uh, training classes in, in customer service. He came in. I said, you know, I've been thinking about this customer service thing. I got a couple of classes. Next thing you know, boom. I, you know, three or three years later, he was from American Express. I was running a corporate university. It's like not waiting for someone to ask. It's going ahead and being proactive. This is about thinking until your hair hurts. These are not easy things. When you start putting it down on paper, this is not easy to do when you're really thinking about what is the very best to me that I want to offer it up and how do I want to offer it up. And it might be different according to which audience, how you offer it to the boss, might be different the way you uh, offer it to a, a coworker. So what is your value? Your definable, protectable, desirable difference. I think those in ISPI, I think we really have a leg up on this that comes from our standards and practice and our craft. I'm going to give you a quick four-step way. I've used this with Wall Street brokers. I've used it with a chiropractor. I've used it with teachers. And you can, you can apply this to just about anything that you do. It's fun. Define, promise, deliver, remind. Let's start with define. This means it needs to be premeditated. Premeditated is one of my favorite words. I feel so sorry for it, though, because people pick on it. Where's the only place you ever hear the word premeditated? Murder. <laughs> now, really icky people can, um, that they dream about bad things can premeditate bad things. Why can't we premeditate our value and our success and what we want to communicate? The next it has to be thorough. This is the thinking till it hurts. Really sitting down, locking yourself away for hours or day, and just making a real thorough accounting of what you bring to the table. And make sure that they are quality components. If you're just learning something, you're not going to put that in your value proposition. But it's something that you've mastered. And it's not something, here's where people also get off on the wrong foot with this. This is not about what I'm going to do, like I'm going to deliver quality service to you. This is about what I know, the expertise I have, the skills and resources, the time and attention that I'm going to eventually promise to deliver to you. And the last thing is it's doable, or as my friend Billy Pollard, who runs Selling Solutions back in Atlanta, says, it has the added advantage of being true about you. Got that? The next is it's printed. You write it down. It usually is less, you know, this is like a mission statement. You want this to be short, less than a page. Many school systems we work with, I walk into teacher's classroom, and they have a promise on the wall behind their desk or when you come into their room where parents and students can see that when you get me as your teacher, here's what I'm going to bring to the table. And if I'm a teacher that's on your team, here's what I bring to the table. If I'm a, a, a broker, and I'm uh, in a brokerage service. This is my area of specialty. This is what I bring to the table. What does another broker bring to the table? We reinforce it verbally. We need to be able to communicate it verbally. It leads to accountability. It gets the glue. It's the glue that holds our relationship together because I have promised for you when I'm your consultant, this is what I'll do for you. Sometimes it's also very helpful to say, as your consultant, this is something I will not do. I will not, for example, recommend something just to make a further sale. I'll only recommend something if it is truly loved by me. And it takes intangible things like our knowledge and our expertise and makes them tangible so as knowledge workers, those things can be valued. When we promise our value, what we're really doing is we're setting the script for our reputation. Way back in, um, I, I, I taught for three years as an English teacher when I first came into the education profession, three years and, and out. And during that first three years, I was really struggling about wanting to stay in teaching because I love teaching, but really wanting to work with adults. And um, I was young, I was impressionable. I had some wonderful senior teachers that really helped me during that first three years with all teachers struggle, especially with classroom management. 
And I remember one day I was sitting in the teacher's lounge and the head of the English department was on one side and the head of the math department was on the other side. And our principal stuck his head in the door, asked somebody something, and then walked back out of the teacher's lounge. Well, our principal, um, I think this was his 25th year on the job. He had never been married. He was an only child. His parents had passed. And he pretty much had given his life to that community and to that school. Well, when Principal Smith walked out, my colleague on the right said to my colleague on the left, if we were the military, he would not be our general. He's more like the company clerk, sort of in charge of getting our pencils and paper clips. And I thought, you know, but I knew they loved him, but they didn't see him as their leader. And it just set me off on this almost lifetime quest for what really is a leader that makes people want to follow or to feel that someone has value that they will respect. And from that day, I thought, when I walk out of the room and the door closes, what do I want people to say about me and my script for my reputation? But see, I have to be very clear about what I want to come out of their mouth in order for them to have that recognition about me. Because if I can't define it unto myself and communicate it, why would I expect them to be able to define it or be able to detect it? The value promise goes something like usually when you hire me, follow me, pay me, choose me, learn from me, here's what I bring to the table. Then comes, after we promise, the delivery part. This means applying our standards with fidelity. It may mean if you're a training organization, rethinking your organizations, more systems and processes for our rethinking public team effort. I learned about value delivery, though, in a very odd place. When I worked for Citigroup, one of our subsidiaries was out in Houston, Texas. It was a brokerage, and they were one winning all sorts of customer service awards. While we had a real problem in our insurance agency um, that I was working with, with uh, both with customer service and policy persistency. And if you're an insurance person, persistence means this means when you sell a policy, it stays on the book. People don't cancel it. And so that I went out to do some benchmarking to see what they were doing in their training department. And this big office building had a mall and a food court downstairs. And so I went ran down there with the lunch, went to get my Chick-fil-A one day. And I walked by, and there was this little shoe shine stand. And I walked by, and this gentleman uh, says, ma'am, and he, he's about five, six, and he's smoking, not smoking, he's just sort of chewing on this big fat cigar about this big. And he pulled the cigar, and he said, ma'am, your, your loafers look like they could use a shot. Well, I've never done that. How many of you, well, especially women, how many of you have ever like, been at the airport and got up in a big chair with brass rail and all that? Yeah, I mean, it's quite an experience if you've never done it. So he's, he's starting, he's chatting me up and he's working on my shoes and, and um, I'm, I have this sickness and, and my husband can tell you if I'm in line in the grocery store and I get a chance to talk to you, I'm going to ask him this question is, how did you choose your profession? Why did you choose it? And if you could choose it again, would you? And so he's asking, he's like, I know you're not from Texas because you don't sound like you're from Texas. And I'm like, okay, well, let me ask you a question. I said, what made you decide to run a shoe shine stand? He stepped back, he took his car, and he said, ma'am, I don't run a shoe shine stand. And I said, well, if you're shining my shoes, is the reason I asked. And he said, um, no, I don't shine shoes. And he said, I extend the life of shoes. <laughs> he took out his car, it said, name, and then shoeologist. Now, I'm, really, I'm never really into shoes anyway. I'm a bad shoe habit. So I'm really paying attention now that I'm with a bona fide certified shoeologist. Do you need me to think about that as a certification? <laughs> and he's got these cubby holes and he's spraying and you know, um, got all this ball he's putting on. Who knows? It's probably all water. But it's like a 12 step process for your shoes. And, and then over here, he's got uh, coffee, decaf, regular. He's got soda, water, that type of thing. There's soft jazz music on the CD player, and all the local, you know, national newspapers and magazines and everything. I mean, the whole thing is quite an experience. I was so swept up in it that when he tapped my shoe and said it was the time to get down, I was just so carried away I didn't want to leave. And so I, I got down, and you know, I've been so caught up in this. I start looking around, and I realize that if all this is I've observed, there is one thing that is missing that I should have paid attention to. What would that be? The price. <laughs> I get beads of perspiration. I have no, I've never done this before. I have no idea. I think this is probably a $25 shoe shine. I've not been taken. And so I said, sir, I said, I don't see a, a, a sign about the price. I said, what I owe you. I was reaching into my purse, bumming around, and he took the cigar. 
throw out of his mouth, but he said the single worst thing you could hear in the situation, which is, whatever you think it's worth. <laughs> now this was back, this was back in the uh, early, early 90s, and so I, I pulled out two fives, and I said, this is for the shoe shine. I have no idea what shoe shine costs, but this is for the experience of value delivery. Because I have no idea what I'm supposed to pay you, but I'm worth, I've, you know, I've, I've paid practically anything at this point because I'm so swept away. And I said, this is real, I'm going to learn about customer service. This is a really a service delivery issue. He took the cigar in his mouth. Remember, he's been calling me ma'am. He took the cigar in his mouth. He looks at me and says, thank you, young lady, and God bless you. <laughs> in one fell swoop, he made me feel young. He brought the Lord into it. He just sealed the deal. <laughs> Gives you a shot at a middle class 
life. But when you look at where we are in global competition, it doesn't give us the shot it used to give us. We have to make sure that we graduate for what? From high school, graduate for what? From college. And that Americans without a high school diploma certainly have, as you probably already know, a lower earning power and job opportunities. In a working lifetime, from ages 18 to 64, school dropouts are estimated to earn $400,000 less than their counterparts who graduated from high school. And if you extrapolate and take that on to college and beyond, often the gap between the high school dropout and the college graduate and beyond becomes over a million dollars over the lifetime. And if you think of what dropouts contribute, most dropouts actually take more out of state, federal, and local taxes than actually they give in. And over their lifetimes, this will be a huge fiscal uh, a burden on the rest of our society. I've heard it said that if, that, that if we could just improve our dropout rate by 10%, we could um, just dramatically improve our quality of life in the United States. One of our challenges, though, is, is that um, this, this, this drag that we have on the economy is actually just pulling us so far back that it's predicted that the economic recession that we have seen is nothing like what we're going to see over our lifetimes of the impact of these kids that don't graduate and can't have a job with a living wage. And the combined lifetime fiscal benefits is if we could get each one of those kids to graduate would be about $250,000 per kid. Now, one in 10 young males in the United States that are dropouts are in jail or detention. The vast majority of our federal uh, prison inmates are dropouts. The average cost to house and, and, and have a, 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 a prisoner in a correctional institute over their incarceration is about $209,000. Now, when we think about what we have to invest, you know, people talk about the cost of public education. Think about what the costs are of not having quality education and what you would want. And young female dropouts are nine times more likely to be single moms than uh, those who go into college. But it really doesn't have to be that way. We have plenty of schools in Georgia where we have kids who are very, very poor that are performing over the 90th percentile. It is not an issue of color of skin. It is an issue of resources, expectations about what kids can do. Over the last eight years, we have had a perfect storm in our country and in Georgia and around the world of political, social, economic challenges. But um, I got the opportunity to, to take this job on and I uh, was determined that I was going to use the ISBI principles in that work. But when I started bringing in things, like one of the first things I did was a task analysis and then I did, I had brought Center for Effective Performance in and we did a task analysis of the work of principles and we did a, um, uh, a uh, factors analysis using the work of Jim and Dana Gaines Robinson and you may, they looked at me like I must have been from Mars. And so I realized that I really couldn't tell them what we were doing. We just had to lean through it together. We brought in K-12 leaders, business leaders, a nonprofit, and the University System of Georgia, and we said we're going to take on this challenge. We targeted systemic improvement of leadership in schools in the state of Georgia, and also uh, targeting that college graduation rate as our lagging indicator. 181 school districts, you can see from very small to very large. We developed this thing called the Georgia Leadership Institute for School Improvement. Everybody wanted to make it into an acronym, as everybody in K-12 does, and so they call it GLSI. And when they have been working with us, and they have uh, 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 transferred a large amount of what we teach them into practice, they say that they have been glissified. So um, we have raving fans. They come to our events. They bought shirts. They got our name on it, their name on it. I mean, I'll tell you what. I can think of any Fortune 50 company out there would love to have our brand. Because, but it's about what Judy said. It's about not blaming educators, but giving them the same opportunity that we give other people and helping them. We rigorously apply the ISPI standards, and this is the work that we turn to. Many of you that are in this room, or many people that have been uh, active in ISPI, and many more. We developed, as Judy likes to call it, a suite of solutions. And we look very systemically from the licensure standards for leaders, to our preparation programs, the, the standards for those preparation programs, how people are compensated, how the work's designed, 
um, a knowledge management system, electronic support systems. How do we look? We looked at all of those things and began putting them in place over eight years. We had external evaluations at a research one university, University of Georgia, and then we met the wonderful Dr. Wendy Rona, who brought us, um, who helped us understand how to use the success cases of Dr. Brinkerhoff. If you go to our website, www.glisi.org, select, select about us, select results, and there are about 15 to 20 success cases there. So if you need any good models, you need any teaching models, anything like that, uh, but um, we especially thank Wendy and Dr. Brinkerhoff for our ability to use that model. It has helped us tell our story in a compelling way with data, and it's so much less expensive than regular evaluation. Here's our results. Georgia Tech, in doing a study on us, said that in 2007, the schools with our, that our leaders were trained by, uh, at, at that cohort of school, uh, schools outperformed the schools that didn't have our treatment on the standards for adequate yearly progress, which is a requirement of no child left behind. 94% of the GLSI districts that we worked with increased their graduation rate by an average of 10.1%, and 50% of those increased it more than 10 points. The researchers at the University of Georgia have looked through our work and they've told us three conclusions about our work. We realize systemic improvement in our state through systemic approaches. We improve the quality and the quantity of the uh, leaders in the pipeline that superintendents are going to hire, and we reduce the time to competency through an uh, entry-level training program we have for aspiring leaders and teacher leaders called Rising Stars, that we reduce the time to competency to know that when superintendents are hiring new principals, they are hiring people that they feel like have an equivalent of three years of experience before they go on the job. The way that principals used to be trained is you were given a set of or you said you've been anointed, you're no longer a teacher, you're a principal, here's the keys, go forth and lead. In a very high stakes environment. 92% of our schools reported that our schools have changed positively, and 100% of the superintendents that we've surveyed said they would enthusiastically recommend our services to their colleagues. It's R S B P results, value, a systemic approach, and partnerships. Our partners are our clients, and our clients are our partners. So that's about our value. But if you were here and you were telling us, what would your value be? How can you communicate it to get a seat at the decision-making table? How can you use it to make a difference? I heard a wonderful CPT uh, story uh, just after lunch. Uh, several of them that were just was fabulous. And one was a, a, a young lady who works 70 at over 80. Uh, hours a week, but she also runs a nonprofit uh, to help people from uh, who are, who are uh, at risk of being separated from their pets because of some economic or other type of uh, a problem that they're having. And she talked about how she applied HBT in setting up that nonprofit. I heard the wonderful rear admiral Donna uh, Crisp talk about how she had um, completely redesigned, reinvented, and the wonderful results she's having. Uh, when she was over a unit in the Navy where she was working uh, with a group that recovers and does forensics on uh, the human remains of fallen war heroes who have not been recovered. She tells us exactly how she applied to CBT principles to. How would you prove your value that you can get the right results and what difference would you make? I'll just ask you if you can't find another way to uh, to make a difference other than your job and what you do every day. Every one of you is a stone's throw from a uh, K-12 school or the school in your country that needs the help of someone like you. You have skills that schools don't have. I, I work with leaders while they don't know how to do project plans. Uh, they've never seen balanced scorecards until we began to work with them. And many of them have told me that they didn't know how to give, do a performance feedback conversation. All things that are second nature to you. If we aren't doing this in our schools, then how will our schools ever really begin to prepare our students for the 21st century? Employers say they want these 21st century skills. And we're people who can model that for students and for teachers and for leaders. Joe Harless has been urging us since 2000 that to make the change that is hard to meet the needs of our world, we need for our children to become accomplished citizens. And right now, schools are having to redesign to meet 21st needs almost every facet of how they operate, but they don't know how to do it the way people like you do. The work has got to change. What children are taught, what they're motivated to learn, what they learn. They have to learn to work collaboratively. Many things you've 
already learned in your organizations. The workplace is changing. Where do we learn the tools and technology? The workers are changing. How do we get good teachers, hire them? You know, it used to be that uh, that that it was very easy for me, people to make the, especially you know, the women, to make the choice to go into education. Now we cannot get enough teachers who have a math and science background to teach our kids uh, to meet 21st century needs. Roger Kaufman has been challenging us with his mega thinking. Societal value is added by what schools use, do, produce, and deliver. Secretary of Education said we've got to stop tinkering around the edges and design and innovate. It's not just in the United States. It's Singapore's vision. And they said if we can't have thinking schools in a learning nation, we will never be up to be able to be a truly world power. Now, um, if you look at the quote from the Vice Chancellor for SRM University, he says it's estimated that one third of all their professional graduates who produced each year in their colleges are not employable. College preparation for what? The United Nations says and education is a fundamental right for all children, and we're talking about 1.5 billion students. So why should you care? You're saying, I'm, you know, I'm not a K-12 person, or maybe I already have kids in school, maybe I have kids, why do I care? Well, if you're in the human performance business, the pipeline that's coming into your organization is sitting in schools right now, either being prepared or not prepared to make your business competitive. We spend over $200 billion a year finding, attracting, and fixing our talents so we can use them. And frankly, the nation's regions and sectors that have the workforce and the students ready for the 21st century are going to have the global advantage. This is another reason to care. The person sticking you up at the ATM is most likely to be a high school dropout. That brings it really close to home, right? Only if our students are prepared to solve the problems in the future will we be able to have the quality of life that we desire. You have the skill sets, you have the ability to solve complex problems. I believe you may be the only professionals with the skill set and the discipline to really step up to a challenge like this. Now it doesn't mean you have to stop doing what you're doing. It can be as simple as volunteering you know, to do some small task if maybe it's just a workflow chart, something like that, that you could give back to your public school system that might make a profound difference. And in this Doug says, if there's chaos, there's profit. The U.S. government is investing billions of stimulus dollars in race to the top funds and on innovative, uh, their, their innovation grants, their school improvement grants. Almost all of these grants are looking for what a lot of school systems are doing so we're going to get the money and then we're going to figure out who's going to do it. If you're a consultant who's looking to figure out how to apply your craft and maybe break into a new sector, the important thing about this grant is it has to be sustainable in three years after the work runs out. It has to have solid project plans, solid evaluation plans. The school systems are out, your academics, they are looking for evaluators. So it may be a market you may not usually think about, but it is a rich market now in terms of uh, that's cash rich and high in need and low in skill. Now, I've talked a lot about K-12 today, and I know many of you have passions in other sectors and other industries. This is just one perfect storm. How many of you are in an organization where you have some type of chaos, complex problems, competition, or something going on? You know, this is not just about K-12. Where you have perfect storms, you are the people with the right skills at the right time. We've got the right stuff, and more than anything, we're so impressed about this is we have a network and we have the ability to connect the great work that Darlene and, 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 and April and June and everyone does. Just those rich resources that we have online and ways that we can connect with each other to work collaboratively around the world. And the right research. Think of the people that is in this room. It ranks as some of the very best in the world. We're the right people at the right time with the right access to solve the problem. But I can tell you how not to gain entry into k -Web. I'm here from the government, military, business, and I'm here to help you. This is how we're doing it. We've been doing it this way for 20 years. Why are you so far behind? The time for criticism, excuses, and second guessing is over. We know more understand how to fix schools because we were students than we know how to fix an airplane because we've been passengers. <laughs> Challenge that we have.
7 to 12 is everybody thinks they understand schools because they've been a student. If you've been recent student, schools are far different than in our time. It's not the principal with the keys, with you know, the wind principal and the view. It's just not like that. These are dramatically different. And if you think about you all you know, heard Columbine and all those things, if you think about the, the challenges that you have when you walk into a public school, there is so much opportunity, so much challenge, and it's easy to say that those kids over there can't learn. But those kids are the ones that if their lights go out, really do have an economic and quality of life impact on all of us. So we can roll up our sleeves, we can pitch in, we can do what we do best, which is listen and analyze and really apply our craft and just stop waiting for somebody to ask us for the right opportunity, for someone else to open the door, thinking somebody else can fix it. People in this room have the ability to solve the complex challenges of our time. And if I can win a seat at that table, I know you can. Bottom line is to tell and sell the proven value, apply the ICPI standards for discipline, and for goodness sakes, please keep your sense of humor. We need to keep you ready. Where there's chaos, there's opportunity, and there's profit, and I believe that there's a chance to really make a positive difference. And I can tell you that being a part of ISPI, and so many of you that I've followed and read your work, and the great thing is, is there's so many other young people, young talent in this room that you know that new talent is going to be writing the next books. And I just, I salute you for the work you do. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. It was great to see these college teams here doing all this great research and working so hard. And so, you know, we have an ISPI industry group, um, you know, an education group in ISPI. A lot of people are getting involved in that. You don't even have to do anything more than just say you're interested. You don't even have to give your time, but maybe have tools or something that you can give to that group that can help us. If you want to learn more about how to use your value to make a difference, especially in education, feel free to give me a call. Uh, and again, thank you. Thank you to the ISBI team. You're just you're the, you're the greatest. I feel so normal. It's wonderful. Have a safe trip off.
play, plane out of Vienna with the ash. He says it was his last plane out. I didn't cause the rest of the problem. <laughs> okay, now moving forward, we want to tell there should be a slide up here with the sponsors, I believe. The conference sponsors. Thank you to the conference sponsors, to Capella, General Physics and Option 6, that's Matt, Donovan, to Booz Allen Hamilton, and Marshall Brown. And any one of you, please consider being a sponsor next year. And your name can be up on that screen. We've put it up over and over and over because we want you to know how much we appreciate the conference sponsors. Remember from the first night when I had this torch? Here it is. Now it's time to pass the torch. So Mickey Lane, come on up. He's the president-elect right now for one more minute. And he's going to be the president in the next minute. So Mickey, you need two hands. Because I'm going to give you a plaque. And the reason they get plaques is they can put them on their wall to convince everyone, I'm so busy, and it's the reason I'm so busy is because I'm the president. See that? And so that explains everything, doesn't it? And here you are. You're going to be a great president. He's got a lot of experience in ISPI, a lot of friends in ISPI, tremendously good ideas, and a deputy chair. Marilyn, his wife, who's going to be very helpful also. So with that, you've got a bright, sparkling torch here, and do good things.
Schneider, who um, is in Germany, couldn't get here because of that infamous volcano. So um, she's also a brand new board member as well. And you can see Darlene's there. And of course, April Davis um, is also on the board as a director. And see April here. And there are um, special, uh, I'm going to take their pledge already.
they were working on their main project was that they had to develop a design plan for what it was that they were going to be producing. And I met with the groups, and there was one group that came from a cargo uh, company that had about five or six uh, refurbished 747s that they were using for cargo lines. And they had come with the problem that they came with, or the issue, was that they were not very profitable as a company. They were losing a lot of money because of the turnaround time on the ground to get the planes that they had loaded and back in the air. They were spending too much time on the ground. They were losing a lot of money. So what they came with was the idea to create a training program for their ground crew, their uh, cargo loaders for the plane. And they wanted a three-day training program for that. Well, as we got into taking a look at what the problem was in discussion, one of the things that we looked at was, um, okay, well, what was the problem? You know, we got into our whole analysis issue. And it turns out that it wasn't the fact that these guys didn't know how to load the plane, all right? They knew how to do it, they could do it very well. So we examined the problem and we took the problem apart piece by piece by piece. And one of the issues that came up was the fact that when the cargo came to the plane to be loaded, and most of the time when you're looking at the tarmac and you see planes being loaded with cargo, they're in these big containers, okay? Well, these guys were carrying oil equipment drilling, okay? So they were carrying pipeline and pipes that were 100 feet long, drill heads, big machinery and things like that, stuff that couldn't be put into nice little containers. And when they got the cargo, they couldn't fit it on the plane, okay? And as a matter of fact, sometimes they had to drill holes in the bulkhead of the plane to load the pipes into it. Right? So they were figuring that's why it took so long to do it. Well, what's the problem there? It wasn't that they didn't know how to load the plane and how to load the plane safely. The problem was that they were a new company and the sales staff was accepting all orders. And when the car came to the plane, they couldn't load it. So the question is, did they actually need did they need a training course on how to load an airplane? No. What did they need? Bigger airplane. Okay, good. Bigger airplane. Yes. <laughs> well, actually, what they needed was some kind of tools for the sales staff to help them do a better job of figuring out what was going to go in the plane. They needed basic simple performance aid or a job aid that they could have in front of them. They weren't going to take all of the cargo that they could. They were just going to load in what they could, what they could sell properly. And now they had a template in front of them with the outline of the play, with all of the configuration and everything, and they were only going to sell what they could load. It makes perfect sense to you, right? who had created and worked on that product two weeks ago. And I said to him, I said, okay, what's happening in your airline right now? He said, Mickey, basically we've created a template. We trained and got our salespeople to use that template effectively. We're now only accepting cargo that we can carry within the guidelines of the airplane. The turnaround time has dropped off by 50% overall. I said, oh, that's great. What's that translate into as far as dollars are concerned? And he said, well, we figured last year was probably a savings of about $7.8 million. $7.8 million for a simple hand-drawn job aid, not a large three-day training program. Okay? Now, where did I learn about that? Where did I learn how to do performance aids and job aids. I first learned about that at an ISBI conference back in 1988 in San Antonio, one of the first ones I attended, from Barry Booth from Caterpillar Industries, who was talking about how to do simple hand-drawn performance 
photovoltaics. I used that, that was here, for something that just came out two years ago. Okay? And that saved that company millions of dollars. Now, I want you to think about one thing. You came here, maybe some of you had some premeditated problems or issues that you were working on before you came here that was really kind of a burning issue in your organization. For those of you who came in with a problem and you found something here at the conference that is going to help you solve that particular problem, would you please stand up? Now, that, stay up, stay up, please stand, please remain standing. How about some of you who didn't necessarily have a particular burning problem, but you learned some things at this conference that you can apply back on the job that are going to deal with certain problems. Did you, any of you get that here? And the rest of you that are sitting down either didn't attend sessions, <laughs> or you learn some things that you're going to apply at some point. Now, the interesting thing is, what I want you to do just for one minute, okay, is turn to a neighbor, two or three of you, and talk about what was that one thing that you got out of this conference that you found to be really valuable to you. Just spend a minute or two and talk to the person next to you.